Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you for dealing with the inclement weather tonight, and making your way over to the museum, doing battle in the parking lot, finding yourself a parking space. It's always a little bit of a challenge, but we like to think the reward is pretty good when you actually finally make your way into the museum. So of course, we are getting near the end of the semester. We're winding down. Thanks to all of you who have made an effort throughout the semester to come to our programs. I think the weather is maybe keeping a few people away tonight. We have a couple more special events and programs scheduled for the rest of this year. One more youth workshop, and that's on December 3rd. So if you have children or grandchildren, you want to tell about this, um, that'll be the Tiny Art Museum with our Director of Engagement, Steve Prince, on December 3rd. It's a Saturday, right, Steve? Yes. Um, we also, this coming Thursday, this is a very busy week at the museum, this coming Thursday, uh, we have our final Music in the Galleries. It's the Middle Eastern Music Ensemble. Really great group led by Ann Rasmussen and uh, always putting on a spectacular program. Uh, so please come out again. I think the weather gets a little better as we move through the week. And then the final couple of programs in our Muscarelli Exploration Series for this fall, The Market for Art. I know all of you have seen the trifold many, many times. This Saturday at 2 p.m., we'll have our good friend Elaine Ruffalo joining us from Florence, Italy. And she'll talk about the Renaissance and what went on between patrons and artists. So talking about how that art market worked about four or 500 years ago. And then as I've reminded you all semester long, Gary Ryan, who's my friend and director and CEO of the Virginia Museum of Contemporary Art, will join me for another virtual program on December 8th in our Muscarelli Reads Book Club. And we'll talk about the book um, by Michael Findlay the value of art, money, power, and beauty. That book has just been updated. I think he originally wrote it in 2010 or 2012, but a new edition just was released last week, and it talks about some of the developments in the art market over the course of the past five to 10 years. So, and I picked it up from Amazon. It just arrived about two days ago. Uh, so um, if you need to get the book, Amazon now has it available. So we'll look forward to having you join us uh, for these upcoming events. To wrap up your uh, burgeoning expertise in the market for art, as you've learned with us all through the semester. So tonight, we're really honored to be joined by Samantha Koslow. She uh, is a Duke graduate and is Senior Vice President, Director of Business Development, she holds many titles, and Head of Museum and Corporate Collection Services at Christie's. As you know, the museum is often in the auction market. We work with people at all the leading auction houses. And I have to tell you, uh, it's been a pleasure to get to know Samantha today. We just ended a very informative hour-long session with a group of about 17 students here talking about careers in the art market, how one forges their way, uh, and a lot of great questions, I think Samantha will agree, came from that group. So um, without further ado, please join me in welcoming uh, Samantha Koslow to talk to us about the international auction market for art. Thank you everyone for coming out. I'm really excited and honored to be here and to be asked to speak about the auction market. Um, just a little bit about me before we start. I've been at Christie's for just under 15 years now. I will have my anniversary coming up in the new year um, and have had the privilege of, of getting to be a part of many of the most exciting sales that have happened at Christie's over that time. Um, I've spent my entire career in various aspects of business development at Christie's, which is a big word for a lot of small, crazy things. Um, it really means I get to do a little bit of everything. Um, I've been fortunate enough to work both in the New York office as well as with our teams internationally in Europe and in Asia. 
um, and really understand how different parts of the business work together and have happily landed in my newest job. As David said, I have far too many ridiculous titles, but I now have the privilege of working with all of our institutional partners, whether that's universities, libraries, art museums, um, cultural institutions, um, both with the museums themselves and with their patrons to try to just be a help um, and, and to come together in ways that we can all support each other. So I was really excited with this opportunity to talk about the art market. What is Christie's? What is our role? What do we do? How do we bring people together? Um, and I thought it would be really interesting to kind of take a quick look at where the auction market is today, then go back in time a little bit to look at how we got there, and then sort of jump forward a bit and look at where are we going and what technology have we been looking at, investing in, thinking about to best position us for the future. So, here we go, okay, that's me. Here we are, this is the art market right now, so to speak, um, and sort of how things have changed over the last few years. Um, and while we don't have the most recent set of sales data because it is literally happening live as we speak, um, we are seeing a really incredible upward trajectory. So the art market has been growing by leaps and bounds. Um, there is, as you will sort of see, there was a, a natural dip during the COVID year where we all sort of figured out what we wanna be. Um, I like to say that we are currently in the phase of being a 250 year old startup. We really had to completely throw the playbook out. We, we had really, we felt like we had it figured out. We celebrated our 250th anniversary just before COVID. Um, and <laughs> very quickly in March 2020, realized that if we were going to survive for another 250 years, we had better really change our perspective. Um, I think, but what this really shows is that there is a consistent desire for people to be participating in the art market. There is room for continued growth. There's a lot of money that changes hands in the art market um, and really important to understand how that all comes together. Um, so I wanted to look at, this is um, charts from a study that comes out every year from Artery, but just looking at sort of the wider market. So this is not just Christie's, this is um, you know data from Sotheby's, Phillips, Christie's, as well as some other auction, more regional auction houses, but looking both at sort of sales value as well as volume, sort of what categories are people participating in the most? Um, and as I think is very clear from these charts, contemporary art is really king in our market today. Um, followed by modern impressionists and then sort of a small sliver of old masters. This is obviously fine arts. Uh, we, it would look different if we included the decorative arts, although again, they would be kind of a small slice of that pie. And what I think is really important to remember is that what, what is contemporary art has obviously changed over time, but there has always been a trend since the beginning of people being really interested in buying the art of their time and, and collecting. Um, and it's a way that people can participate in the secondary market in a way that can sometimes feel more approachable than old masters, let's say, where, or, or a category that has been more established where people often get sort of priced out or felt like they can't participate at the same level. And then we're gonna look at one more chart before we go on our little history lesson together and looking at the global nature of the art market. So there's a couple of things that are, that are interesting about this. Um, although the pie is sort of broken up by different European countries, I think what jumps out is that the art market is pretty evenly split across US, Europe, and Asia, um, each one making up about a third of the, the market. Um, and I think that's really important to think about. This is a chart from 2021, and I am certain that our chart in 2022 will look pretty similar. Um, this really speaks to sort of where we are in the global nature of our business. One of the things we really strive for at Christie's is, is 
figuring out how to be accessible to a global audience. So whether you are located in Williamsburg, Virginia, or whether you are located in a province of China, you see the same website, you come to the same Christie's, um, regardless of, of where you're coming from. And really making what we do more transparent, easier to access, and easier to understand. Um, so we've invested a lot in, in that education and how we can bring people to our site, bring them in, and get them comfortable with participating with us. Um, because at the end of the day, we are just a marketplace, just like Amazon or Artsy or any of those others, um, eBay even. We are an auction platform, so anyone you know can come in. Of course, there are different levels at Christie's. So we have online sales with starting bids of $100, and then we have everything ranging from that to our mega evening sales where you know, we just completed last week an auction of the collection of Paul Allen that we'll get to. Um, where we had five works sell for over $100 million. So we really run, run the gamut of, of everything that you can imagine. Um, but again, how did we get there? So I thought this is sort of where we are. This is the international makeup. Um, and I think another thing that's really interesting about looking at this chart is these buyers are coming to Christie's from all over because we really changed to a more digital model and made it a lot easier to participate from the comfort of your own home to get information about works of art um, regardless of where you are. But again, I really do want to go back to the beginning. I talked about we're a 250-year-old startup. Where did we start? So I'm going to take you on a little history lesson, indulge me, because um, I promise it's interesting. Uh, so 1766, like I mentioned, uh, we have our first sale. We were originally a London-based company. This is Paul Mall in London. If any of you have ever visited our London headquarters, it hasn't changed that much in 250 years. Uh, we love tradition. But it was really an every man's auction house. So we sold everything from books to household furnishings. We famously had a sale of chamber pots. Um, we were really just a, a place where people could, you know, disperse of their estates. Um, and for a while, that was sort of how we operated. Um, but eventually, James Christie, who was our founder and principal auctioneer, kind of realized that in order to build a business that was going to have a lasting impact. He really had to have a way to reach people and, and showcase not just household furnishings, but the art of their time. Um, so in seven, oh, yep, there we go. In 1780, we sold this painting and we have a lot of sort of what we call friends of Christie's, these paintings that somehow like come back to us again and again over time. This is one of them. So it's a few years in, and this was a really monumental sale. Um, this work was painted in 1765. So at the time of this sale, it was still certainly a very contemporary art. Um, it was the first time it was sold. This work has since come back to us three more times, um, most recently in 2011, setting a record for the artist uh, at 22 million pounds, which was about 40 million dollars at the time, but I think it's really important to to look at this painting and understand that it was really, it was this monumental, important piece of contemporary art at its time, and James Christie was sort of realizing that he had to harness that energy and look at what artists were popular, what were people interested in, and, and build his business around that. So jumping ahead a bit, 1892. I think this is a painting that probably is familiar to many people. It is Degas' famous absinthe drinker. Uh, this sale was the top lot of that sale. Um, it sold for, <laughs> what I, I love this, $189 at the time. So if you had had some really forward-thinking ancestors, could have got a real bargain at Christie's. 
uh, <laughs> back in the 1890s. Um, but again, this work had just been exhibited in the 1877 Impressionist exhibition in Paris. It was very controversial at that time. This is really early to be having a sale of Impressionist art and, and putting it on a main stage. So there is this sort of history of Christie's really looking at what was going on, what was happening. You know, we talk about ourselves often, you'll hear Christie's or other auction houses referred to as the secondary market. So we're often not working directly with artists. We are the second or third or fourth or 100th time a, a painting has been sold. Um, but something that I think we've always looked to do is to be aware of what is happening on the primary market and be really connected. So just in the same way that here at the museum, you have curators, you have your wonderful director who are constantly out there going to fairs, going to galleries, talking to all of you, the collectors, finding out what your interests are, what, what's going on out in the wider market, we're doing the same thing. We're talking to, talking to artists, talking to galleries, talking to museums, understanding what's exciting them because that is ultimately what's gonna be exciting to our collectors. Um, we're gonna jump ahead again to 1970. So I find this work really fascinating. This is a work by Velazquez. Um, it's a portrait of his assistant. This was the first work of art to ever be sold at auction for a million pounds. So it was a huge price and, and really the first time we crossed into this upper echelon of the market. Um, a fun fact is that with today's inflation, this apparently would have been the same as spending 140 million pounds. So this was a big, big purchase at the time. Um, and what I think is remarkable is that, you know, this is his assistant. This is not some lord or king or fancy person. This is a really intimate portrait of someone who is effectively, you know, a the help. Um, and I think it's really fascinating to see how intimately Velazquez painted this portrait, but also see how this is a work that really resonated with collectors and, you know, gained its rightful place in the history of art. Um, so, you know, it does speak to a lot of the trends that have continued to happen in, in, um, in the art market, but again, really interesting to see this sort of shift happened to this focus on the higher end area of the market and our ability to really source the best of the best. Um, so a few years later, at that point, we were still just a London-based operation. Um, we opened our New York office in 1977. We were not at our grand Rockefeller Center headquarters where we are now, uh, our first New York sale location was the ballroom of the Hotel Delmonico. Um, and it was sort of strategically located on the Upper East Side, right in between the Upper East Side and Midtown um, on Park Avenue. And again, it was about going to collectors where they were, sort of meeting this elite of New York society and putting together an auction. And it, it was basically an event that would excite people and. I think at that point, people thought of art auctions as sort of this stuffy, European, London-based phenomenon. In New York, we were, it was a different kind of grittier art scene, but we had to sort of come up with a way to, again, go to the people and get people excited about participating in the secondary market in this interesting way. Um, I think it's really fun to know that we had, um, our first sale was an Impressionist sale in New York and included Renoir's famous Femme Nue Couché, which was um, his, one of his most important reclining nudes. So again, bargains could have been had back in uh, at Christie's in the day. They can still happen, but they're rare to come by now. <laughs> um, so then about 10 years later, 
Christie's continued to expand um, and look again, where are clients, where, where are new potential collectors? So in 1986, we opened our first office in Asia, in Hong Kong. Um, this was also in the ballroom of the Mandarin Hotel. So again, our first sort of attempts at doing sales outside of London were happening mainly in these gathering places for collectors where they could come together, have sort of a fun exhibition party, and then the sale was a part of the experience. Um, at that time, our sales in Asia were mainly focused on the arts of China, um, and then slowly we started integrating other categories, including luxury, so wine, watches, things that did appeal more to that market. And it's been interesting over time, there's been a huge growth in the contemporary art sales that we're ha having in Asia, both in Hong Kong as well as now in Shanghai. Um, and I think that's interesting to know that Christie's is still to this day the only international auction house that can operate in mainland China. Um, again, we've always tried to think forward instead of thinking back and trying to think where are the next group of collectors going to be coming from and getting to where they are. So we opened that office in 2011 um, and still it's over 10 years later and no one else has figured out how to do it. Um, we are, we have, we have an office space in Hong Kong, but we have never had still to this day our own sale room. We are finally opening our Asia Pacific headquarters in Hong Kong in 2024 um, and really establishing we will now again, be the only auction house with a significant large presence and a proper sale room there in Hong Kong. So something to look forward to. But now here we are, this is my home where I've spent many days of the last 15 years. Uh, so Christie's opened in Rockefeller Center in the year 2000 with this really amazing Solowit mural that you can see in this picture, um, again, a contemporary artist. So we worked with a contemporary artist to design this space. It was really important to us that our entrance felt welcoming, that we it was, are seen in this bustling New York metropolis as a place for art that you can see from, you know, when you're standing at that Rockefeller Center Christmas tree, if you cross the street, you're kind of beckoned into Christie's. And we hope the idea being that we're drawing people in, we're getting them to come up to our windows and our doors and hopefully drawing them across that threshold. Um, so when we moved to Rock Center at that time, again, we were all different categories of art, which we still have, but it's fun to know our first sale there was an old master drawing sale that achieved $9.5 million. Um, so a nice sale. We're, we're going to jump forward in time in a minute, but to know that as we've grown our online business, we had our first online sale in 2011 uh, with the collection of Elizabeth Taylor. Some of you may have seen that really fun sale to be a part of. By that point, our online sale for that collection realized the exact same total, $9.5 million. So it's just to show that in only 11 years, there was this huge shift from these traditional sales to more online. Um, so as we've grown the business, I think one thing to note that Christie's has done is really turned from just being an art auctioneer into being an international marketing machine. Um, so when you think about Christie's, of course, you might think about our art experts, but what you might not think about is that we are a huge international logistics business where we are moving art all around the globe. We are constantly matching up buyers and sellers. We're also putting on these tremendous marketing campaigns. Um, so 2009 was a really interesting moment in the art market. Um, I'm sure you all remember the financial markets took a hard crash in 2008 when Lehman Brothers fell. Nothing was looking great. Um, I was very early in my career there and was certain that I was, you know, going to be out the door quite quickly um, if I didn't make myself <laughs> useful. So it was amongst that backdrop that in February 2009, we were tasked with putting on 
this incredible sale of the collection of Yves Saint Laurent. So obviously many people will know the YSL as the amazing fashion designer, but what was perhaps slightly lesser known, although he wasn't shy about it, was his amazing propensity for collecting and hoarding objects. So he had incredible art, but also just hundreds upon thousands of decorative arts and objects and fabrics and pieces of furniture and this amazing collection, which was incredibly over the top. Um, you can sort of see it in this picture of the Grand Palais in Paris. This sale happened in Paris. Um, we put on this huge event, but we had to figure out how to make this lavish, over the top lifestyle feel approachable in the midst of a global economic crisis. Um, and really worked with our marketing and exhibition teams to put on, you know, before the days of immersive Van Gogh and crazy exhibitions that you are living inside of videos, you know, we put on these exhibitions that toured the world that really told the untold story of Yves Saint Laurent and Pierre Berger, who was his partner, and recreated their interiors and gave people this opportunity to sort of get inside of their minds and their collecting habits um, and, and live inside of their world for even a few minutes or a few hours. Um, the sale was a tremendous success. Um, it realized nearly $500 million um, and amongst other things, was only the second time ever that one artist's record was broken twice in the same sale. So. A tremendous success and again um, it was at the time the record for any private collection that was ever sold and I believe still stands as the record for any collection ever sold in Europe so really a testament to Christie's ability to tell stories to make something that could have been a really dark moment this really exciting celebration um, that ends our history lesson. I hope that was somewhat interesting and informative. So where are we now? So I talked about 2009 financial crisis. In 2020, we have another <laughs> major sort of world crisis when COVID hit. And you might think that no one was probably worse prepared for that than Christie's, a live auction business that was all about bringing people together, connecting art and um, connecting the art with the collectors. But there actually was a lot of change that had been happening at Christie's over the last decade leading up to COVID that sort of prepared us for, for what happened. So I wanna talk a little bit about that and then talk about how we have change and where we're going. Um, so I mentioned earlier, um, we did have our first online sale in 2011. So by 2011, things were looking better, the market had been recovering, um, and we had this incredible opportunity to share with the world the collection of Elizabeth Taylor. So again, she was really well known for her jewelry um, and her sort of extravagant taste. I think she had six or eight different husbands in her life. She lived a full, amazing life. Um, she also had just incredible couture and costumes. Um, but she also had a lot of trouble in her life. Um, you know, she had, she did have all of those divorces. She had fluctuations in her drinking and different things that happened throughout her life. So we had to take this story that had really high highs, but also low lows, and really paint a picture of the Elizabeth Taylor that she would have wanted to share with the world. Um, so again, we staged a remarkable sort of global exhibition. Um, there were queues miles long. Um, up until Paul Allen, it was actually the record for attendance of any exhibition at Christie's, so it took us 11 years to break that record, but um, it was wild when you saw people sort of looping around the block of Rockefeller Center and we were like, oh, they're not queuing up to go into NBC to like watch a night show. They actually want to come to Christie's. Like, this is amazing. Um, 
but really telling her story in a thoughtful, um, appropriate way. But then what we realized during this sale was that she did, Elizabeth Taylor also collected obsessively and had really amazing high-end jewelry, but she also had a lot of costume jewelry and other sort of trinkets and knickknacks from throughout her life. And we realized this was an incredible opportunity to share her story with not only the people who can buy a $10 million diamond, you know, we can share this story with a much wider public. And so we took a risk and put on an online sale. Um, so I already gave away the punchline, but we had this huge, the, the whole collection totaled hundred over $150 million, um, but the online sale alone raised $9.5 million, and I believe the estimate was somewhere between $100,000 to $200,000. Um, so it was really a lot of objects that held value mainly in their sentiment and their connection to this larger-than-life figure. So really interesting to think about how we changed our model to reach a much wider audience. Um, so online sales are a really interesting part of the story um, that are ever growing part of the story, but I just thought it was interesting to look at, jump ahead a little bit and look at how online sales across auction houses have really changed over the last few years. Um, obviously, you know, Phillips is a smaller player here, but I think still interesting in that all three auction houses um, were sort of the three largest auction houses working internationally right now, and especially in the contemporary art space, and looking at, at the rise in both the number of sales that have happened, but also the value of those sales um, in the recent years. Um, so there's a little bit of a dip down after, I think, the 2020 year, which is the year in black in the middle. Obviously, basically everything was online, so those numbers are skewed a little bit. But still, those figures of 2021, like we still have these major sales happening um, now online. Um, we actually had our highest value sales online ever in 2021. Um, we realized over $445 million dollars. That's online only sales. That doesn't account for also people bidding online, all of that. So it's huge, huge amount of volume of our sales that are now happening online. So many different tools have gone into sort of how we got our collectors comfortable. Because you might think like, oh, that's all well and good and it's nice to see things online, but don't people really want to see the art? Like, and, and so much about art is about having a relationship with a painting or a sculpture or a drawing or a photograph or whatever it is. You know, that aha moment when you're standing in a gallery and looking at a work of art and how it, it changes you and changes your appreciation. Um, I heard someone say recently that you should never be intimidated by a work of art. You know, approach it with confidence, and and then you know you'll you'll feel ready to just take it in and have that whatever that experience is for you. And there's no right or wrong experience. But what we've had to figure out in an increasingly digital and fast-paced world is how to give people as much of that experience as we possibly can. And I stand strong in saying there is nothing that will ever replace the experience of standing in front of a work of art. Um, that's why I love my job. I get to stand in front of incredible works of art every day. Um, and we're not trying to replace that, but we're also trying to provide other ways to engage. And hopefully, you know, by the time you're standing in front of that work of art or you're trusting a friend, an advisor, your specialist contact, your curator who you work with, you know, that's the final piece of the puzzle, but we've given you a lot of tools in order to get, you know, 90% of the way there. So I've, met, I've talked a lot about Asia. I think it's a really important area of the market to, to be aware of and think about. So in 2013, so again, long before COVID, um, Christie's launched our platform on WeChat. We were also very early to do that and have developed a system that is really far and away above you know, where others are. Sorry, I skipped ahead on my notes. Um, 
I think it's really interesting. So if you're not familiar with WeChat, WeChat is the most popular social media platform used in Asia. They have over 1.2 billion monthly users and over a quarter of those users spend four hours or more on this app per day. So if you know, we all say, oh, we spend too much time on our phones. Like people in Asia really, really spend a lot of time on their phones <laughs> using WeChat. And it's an app that it basically does all the things we, you know, we all maybe have a hundred apps on our phone. WeChat does all of them. So you can do all of your banking, your shopping, um, everything is sort of integrated into WeChat. So your whole life can exist on WeChat. It's also how you share your photos, how you message with your friends, everything happens there. So again, since 2013, we've had over 70% growth. So we have new users joining the platform every day. But it was important to establish a presence so that people in who use WeChat don't think of Christie's so much as a brand who's spamming them with ads, they think of us as an integrated part of their experience on WeChat. So again, really early on, we had all of our catalogs on there, everything was translated, and now you have the ability to actually bid and in real time through WeChat. You can also chat with our experts live. So we started really early, but that's allowed us to be in a place now where this is a fully integrated part of our experience for our users um, in Asia and across you know, the world who are on WeChat. Another investment, I don't have a slide to this, but just to think about, like we were at this time also thinking about improving our regular website. So investing in better cameras, better technology that allows you to see the surface of a work of art. And that led to in 2020, again, we'll get there, but our ability to transition to a more digital sale platform. But so when we were, so this 2017 was the first time we had a live streamed auction. So this is another really one of the great moments that I've had the privilege of being a part of. I'm sure you've all seen the documentary. If you haven't, it's worth checking out, but we sold, the last Da Vinci um, in 2017. So this Salvatore Mundi, it was a hotly contested item for a time, but the scholarship landed on this is a Da Vinci, we can sell it. Um, and if you've seen the movie or you've read any of that press, this achieved $450 million, which I have to believe will stand as the record for any work of art sold for a very long time because it really is kind of mind bending. Although then when we go back to our Velazquez, you know, maybe in 20 years time, that'll be nothing if inflation keeps going at the rate that it is. But for now, this certainly um, is far and away the record. But we knew we were having this moment where we had a work of art that we had been entrusted with that was larger than any of us. It was larger than the New York art market. It was larger even than just the art world. Like this was a sort of global spectacle that was happening. So we had to find a way to, up until this point, maybe 100, 200 people would tune in to watch our live auction feed. It was a very narrow window where, if you can imagine, I'm the auctioneer only view you would see was me and the podium. You couldn't see the art. So if you were watching online, it was not a dynamic experience. It was very, it was very boring, to be honest. Um, it was mainly people who were listening to want to know when their lots would be coming up so they could call in to their Christie specialist. So we decide we're going to invest some money, we're going to bring in a camera crew, and we're actually going to film this happening in the room, so you can see the dynamic angles of the room, you can see people bidding. It was very exciting. So at that time, we had we went from you know our couple of hundred users to over 650,000 people tuned in. It was a 19-minute bidding battle. Um, it's actually a really fun, you can watch it on YouTube. Um, it's a fun, I won't make you sit here and watch a 19-minute bidding battle, but 
it's actually quite a fun thing to watch because there's sort of there's some initial bidding there's a few people going for it and then all of a sudden somebody sort of ratchets the bidding up by a hundred million dollars and a you know it's it's it was an incredible moment um I too made that sound in the room <laughs> um but again it, it really showed us there's an interest in watching what we do and it's not only that people of course we want bidders to be tuning in and paying attention but we can actually provide it's educational and it's interesting and it's a way to really learn about art auctions how people participate um, you know, how many people are bidding live in the room versus people who are on the phones versus people who are clicking a button and bidding online. And now we really sort of opened the curtain, so to speak, and we let people see into the room. Whereas up until that point, it was, you know, those evening sales were sort of by invitation only. And it was a very small group of people that actually got to participate in the room. So this was a huge turning point for us and one that we have never looked back from. Um, like I mentioned, we had the privilege of selling the collection of Paul Allen last week and we'll sort of get there, but we had over 2 million people watching that sale online. So again, it really speaks to the growth in people's desire to participate and, and learn and, and engage with us in this new way. Um, just being conscious, I've I like to talk about my job, as I think you can tell. Um, <laughs> but I'll try to get, get to the end. Um, I did mention, so I talked about Yves Saint Laurent. Um, we had another tremendous privilege. In 2018, Christie's was selected to handle uh, the estate of David Rockefeller. And this was a moment for us where Christie sort of planted a flag about the auction house that we want to be in the future. So while technology and growing in that way is one huge part of it, our commitment to philanthropy is another huge part of it. Um, and around this time, Christie's kind of came out with some pillars. We really, we thought about our mission. You know, we, we think a lot about art museums having missions. We too have a are a mission-driven organization and have made huge commitments to sustainability, to diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace. And we were doing that, you know, maybe we could have done it even longer ago than this, but 2018 was a huge change for us in terms of deciding we were really going to be the auction house for philanthropic sales. So David Rockefeller collection raises $832 million. 100% of which goes to charity. So at that time, this was the record for any collection. It surpassed that Yves Saint Laurent collection that I mentioned earlier, but by far and away, the most important single charitable sale that had ever happened. Um, and and his, he supported a wide range of causes, including art museums and art institutions. Um, his alma mater, but also a lot of conservation programs and programs that had commitments to similar causes around sustainability. Um, so that was really exciting and important to us. Um, and a white glove sale, so which was really unheard of at the time, which means that every single work of art included in this auction was sold. So in that same year, like I said, philanthropic commitments, we also, again, were pushing the envelope on technology. So in the fall of that year, the Rockefeller sales happened in the spring, we had the first sale ever recorded on a blockchain. And I promise you, I will not give you a lecture tonight about NFTs and crypto and the blockchain, but if anyone wants to talk about it later, we can. Um, my most important thing I will tell you is you don't have to like it, but learn three facts about it, because it is such an interesting part of where we are going in the future. And I think it's important to be able to understand why the blockchain has become such an important part of the art market. Um, so Barney Ebsworth was an amazing collector. Um, sorry, this is the sale of Barney Ebsworth. Um, and he was really an American art collector. Not particularly remarkable in that way. He did have this unbelievable Edward Hopper in his collection, but 
he, he was a very sort of traditional collector in that way, but had a great love of technology, um, and so did his family. And it was really important to them that they, they had this ability to record this sale. So the blockchain, obviously, it's being talked a lot about in the crypto markets, but really the blockchain is just a ledger, a digital ledger for recording transactions that happen. So the idea that we can record sales on the blockchain and keep an immutable digital record of provenance is really exciting to us and the implications that that could have for improving transparency in the art market. Um, so we're spending a lot of time, we are researching, we're learning, we are growing, but this was a really important start in that process. So, of course, before we talk about NFTs, 2020 happened, like I mentioned. Um, we shut down like, so, like the rest of the world um, in March of 2020 and did not hold a sale until July. It was the first time we had ever canceled our major art auctions, our spring art auctions. They survived through world wars. They survived through you know, financial crises, but COVID was the one thing that finally did them in. Um, and we, we pivoted. So we completely, quite literally, threw our entire auction room out. We got rid of the rostrum. We got rid of the seating in the room and, and turned, if any of you have been to our Rockefeller Center headquarters, um, our big main auction room was completely transformed into a TV studio, effectively. So thank goodness we had that experience starting in 2017 that we kind of knew what we had to do and we knew we had to invest in lighting. We had to entirely change the walls out to be a floor to ceiling LED screen. Because um, if you've been to an art auction, the way it used to happen was an art handler or a special mechanical tray would bring out the painting. Now the paintings come out in their full digital, larger than life glory. Um, and it's just this really dynamic experience. So the sales moved entirely online. We had a sale that we called our one auction. It was the first time that we had a sale that happened simultaneously in four different locations. We had an auctioneer in Hong Kong, London, Paris, and New York, and it was a relay sale that went across the world over the course of like eight hours. It was completely insane, um, but it was a way that we could kind of get everybody engaged and sort of show Christie's is back. Um, we also invested in technology so that we made digital models of all of our galleries. You could actually go on digital walking tours through the gallery, see the works of art. Like I said, you can zoom in on them up to 800% of their surface. Um, so you could really get up close and personal with the details of those paintings. Um, so, and it did okay. It wasn't the best sale we've ever had, but it was a learning experience. And we continued to learn and adapt and grow throughout the fall and into the spring of 2021 when we decided to take arguably one of the bigger risks we've ever had, although sort of it was a big risk and a low risk in the same time in that if it hadn't done well, it would have sort of been, okay, well, we tried it. Um, we offered this work, The Every Days, by the artist known as Beeple. Um, and we offered this in an online sale. And the estimate was estimate unknown, but the starting bid was $100. Um, so this is an NFT. The artist Mike Winkleman, who's known as Beeple, every day for 5,000 days drew one digital image. And then this is a compilation of all of those sort of 5,000 digital. There he, he drew, you can kind of see in the upper left quadrant in the beginning, it was much more like he was sketching on an iPad. As he progressed, they become much more involved. He learned how to work with different software programs and design these really involved digital images. Um, but it's a compilation of 5,000 images. At Christie's, obviously, while <laughs> we always are trying to do new things, we are also, you know, want to do the best of the best. So this is really an outlier in terms of this really vast portfolio of work. So we offered this work for sale. Nobody had any idea what would really happen, but um, if you know the end of this story, this work sold for $69 million. 
is the highest price ever achieved for a digital work of art and also at this time was the third highest price that had ever been achieved for any work by a living artist. So really remarkable. Um, but what is most interesting about this is that the participants were almost three quarters were under 40 years old. So this was a demographic of buyers and collectors who were completely new to Christie's. They're almost entirely all new to participating in the art, the traditional art market, and was again a wake up call that if we're going to survive for another 250 years, we have to continue to adapt and grow and learn the new technology and we're not gonna love all of it. Some of it will have booms and busts and that's okay too and a part of, part of the learning process. I'm gonna show you a couple very, very quick more things because I know we're getting close to time and I meant to leave time for questions and I'm doing a bad job of that. Um, so just some other innovations that I think are quite fun. We have also invested in this company called Proto and we now own several of these hologram machines that are allowing us to tour property around the world without actually touring the property. So this is a hologram. This is not the real Degas, but it is shown in life size. This is a huge, heavy bronze uh, that would have been extremely costly and also carbon very unneutral, um, so expensive and risky to ship around the world. So instead, we toured it virtually. Uh, 1,200 visitors saw this sculpture uh, in the hologram machine in Hong Kong, uh, London, and San Francisco and Los Angeles. So just something fun to know that we're experimenting with. And then our most recent technology, we just announced about a month ago, Christie's has launched Christie's 3.0, which is the first, um, we are the first auction house, international auction house again, to have a fully on-chain marketplace, which means all transactions on this marketplace are happening recorded on the blockchain, like I mentioned. Um, before we were selling NFTs just in our regular sales. So those sales were happening off the blockchain and then had to be basically recorded back onto the blockchain. So we were trying to really be authentic, again, learn where those new collectors are transacting, how they want to transact, how they want to interact with Christie's, and we, we built the platform for them. Um, it's been really exciting so far. We worked with a lot of experts in the space. Um, we just had our first sale. It was a single artist collection of, I believe, 10 works by an artist named Diana Sinclair. So a really exciting up and coming digital artists. And we now have a whole team of people that are dedicated to researching digital art, getting to know the artists, looking for the ones that are the best fit with Christie's and looking for opportunities to expand this platform. But don't worry, we are still Christie's. Our other huge pillar, like I mentioned, is of course fine art sales at the highest levels, although we are genuinely committed to offering art at every single price level and bringing collectors in. Um, but just a couple more sales to mention. Um, really exciting collections. We continue to tell interesting stories. Um, in the first half of this year, we also had the Amon collection, which sold another iconic work of art, uh, Andy Warhol's Sage Marilyn, which also set a record for that artist and achieved a whopping $195 million. So, you know, the hits keep on coming at Christie's. Um, but again, that entire collection went to charity. And I will just quickly run through two amazing sales that happened this fall, Anne and Gordon Getty as well as Paul Allen. Again, 100% of both of those collections also going to charitable causes. So this fall alone, we've raised over $1.8 billion, all for charity, hugely exciting, great things are happening. And I think what we're really finding is the future of the art market. Um, it's not just about offering works of art, it's also about being able to tell their stories, tell them in interesting ways that connect with people. People care about stories and provenance, but also being able to interact with works of art in different ways. And so we're really trying to tread both of those paths of being technology forward, but never losing that essence of who we are 
storytellers who I hope can continue to bring together collectors with exciting works of art, um, you know, and be really good partners to the rest of the art world, whether that is museums, institutions, or private collectors, and, and be a place where everybody can come together and, and we hopefully keep the art world thriving so we all can continue to enjoy the art that I know brings us all here. So thank you. That was a lot of me talking.